This week we are looking at Matthew chapter 9 and 10. And David, give us a little context. Where are we in Matthew's gospel? Well, Colin, I think for our purposes, I want us to think of this as sort of the beginning of the, the New Testament vision of the church. And I've um, we're starting here because I want us to see the way in which Jesus is this renewed Israel himself. So the, the latter parts of the Old Testament all end with um, Israel has come back from exile. There have been struggles, um, and they're still not fixed necessarily. They're still not perfectly faithful, perfectly obedient. There's still immense problems within the people of God. And so this is just one little glimpse into the vision of the renewed Israel. So you'll notice in the reading, there's, there's healing, there's a commissioning, there's the sending out of the apostles to do all of these things, restoring people's own bodies. Um, so this is a, a, a beginning image, a foretaste, uh, not even really a foretaste, but an instantiation of what God is pursuing in renewing this people of Israel into his own. And Jesus, of course, is the, the first. He is the perfect Israelite, God's presence made present in human form. So that's the context. This is the beginning of the renewed Israel. You know, at one point, Jesus refers to Israel as sheep or a flock. Well, why is he using this, this type of language to refer to the people of God? Yeah, I think, there are, I think there are two reasons for this. And the first one is that the Old Testament tends to use this language to describe Israel somewhat reg regularly. So if you read back in Isaiah chapter 40 or in Zechariah, other minor prophets, dozens and dozens of the Psalms, Israel is, is referred to as, as sheep or a flock, and God is referred to as the shepherd. So for one, there's this precedent that the people of God in the Old Testament and in the New are referred to as sheep. Of course, all of that would make sense to people in this context, but notice it still does even in our own day and age. Most of us are at least somewhat familiar with what it would mean to have um, sheep and a shepherd. Now, the second is because I believe what, what the sort of base note theological um, imperative here is we are, as the people of God, uh, we need a shepherd. You know, a flock of sheep requires a shepherd. If you've ever spent time around sheep, it's, it sounds crass, but they're, they're dumb. They're pretty stupid. They need someone to guide them and protect them. They're not the most ferocious creatures that you ever run into. You don't get scared if you run into one in the middle of the night. And so you, you see they need a shepherd to guide them and protect them. Part of what he's saying here is he sees all of these masses of um, people in Israel he says they're listless, they're, they're all over the place. They're like sheep without a shepherd. And so part of what he's getting at is he has come to be that shepherd, whereas God in the Old Testament was this, um, this uh, shepherd who, while I wouldn't say is distant, was involved in his people through a mediated sort of access point. Here, the shepherd himself has showed up. He is healing his people, bandaging their wounds, renewing their bodies, their eyesight, um, and he's showed up to be that actual shepherd. So the people of God here is, is meant to be thought of, like listless sheep, people who need the order, organization, protection, and affection of a shepherd. That's why. You know, when, when Jesus sends the 12 out, he tells them, don't go to the Gentiles, don't go to the Samaritans, only go to the house of Israel. Why is Jesus so focused on Israel in this passage? Um, versus the Gentiles and Samaritans? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a great question. And I, I wouldn't pretend to know that on, it's, some of that is a mystery, of course. But my, my personal inclination is to think of this as, rather than a kind of exclusive um, shoving away, actually as a beginning to the inclusion of all peoples. And it also reveals to us the particular passion that God has for his people. You know, you think of uh, the affection that, a spouse might have for their husband or wife, it is necessarily in some ways a kind of exclusive affection. It's given for them only. And so here we see the way that God, through Jesus, he has come to bring back her bride, another figure we've looked at. His flock is his and he will do anything for them. He'll grow to any length, any measure. 
he will leave the 99 to go get the one. So this is, I think, a symbol of his unrelenting affection and love for his people who belong to him, who he has created. And then after he has poured himself into these people, um, healed them, cleansed them, given them a deep, deep and abiding sense of who he is as a God, then it pours out and spills out into the rest of humanity, the Gentiles, the Sumerians, everyone else. But first you get the sense as if it has to begin with them. Why? Because Jesus is a Jew. And why is that? Because God has created his people out of Abraham. And that's where it started. So he has to begin there. But again, the, the thing to note is I, I believe this is a symbol um, of his great love and mercy rather than simply an exclusion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thinking about the church today, what, what does this teach us about the church? What's the application here for us? Mm, yeah. The takeaway. Yeah, I think the great takeaway is First, what I've just mentioned, it's two things. But first, it's that his affection for his people, it is like nothing else. It can't really be qualified or quantified. It is um, absolutely baffling. So you see the way in which he has this flock that he shepherds. He grows them out of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They turn into a nation. You see this whole trajectory of the church on the move. He is pouring himself into these people. And then when Jesus shows up, you see the incredible lengths he has gone to to restore this people who have been unfaithful to him and to show them how much he loves them. So in other words, us as the church, one of our primary jobs is simply to bask in and receive the, the abundant love and mercy of Jesus, of God, the one who's created us, sustains us, and guards us. So that's, that's one. The flock needs to, to delight in its shepherd. Now, the second thing is, <clears throat> I do think that we are called to listen to the shepherd. There is this sort of positive command here. Marjorie is um, gonna talk about it in a session, a couple sessions, but we are, as sheep, uh, delighted to listen to our shepherd. And then finally, this is really fascinating because later on you'll see Peter is commissioned to take care of uh, Jesus' sheep, We'll see also in Revelation, there's a, a mention of um, sheep. We become, in fact, sort of many shepherds for the kingdom of God. So there, there is a role to play where we get to embody out that affection that God has and to extend that guidance um, of the good shepherd into people. And of course, um, that's what we try to do as clergy. I'll never forget the, the, the thing that a mentor told me right before I got ordained, he said, um, I said, you know, what should I do when I become a priest? He said, love your people and pray with them. And that was it. Of course, there's way more to do as a clergy person, but that is the call that we all have, the priesthood of all believers, to love one another and to extend that unyielding affection to one another and to embody the shepherd himself. So I'd say it's those three things, receive the great love, to, um, you know, obey the great shepherd, and to embody the way he loves the world. Well, thank you. It's such a rich passage and a, and a rich image of flock. Uh, and we hope you have a rich conversation as you explore the passage and talk about what it means for the church today.